Hi, this is Mark Lindsay, and we're going to talk about um, registering and non-registering SIP devices. Two different ways of connecting our SIP devices to one another. First, let's talk about the basic model. So, in this case, we've got a phone and an SBC talking to a web server through, um, through SIP registration. And then we've got sort of another common case, which is a PBX connecting through possibly the same SBC to the VoIP server. The blue line, however, would represent a common case where the PBX is not actually registering, while the SIP phone actually is registering. And so the question is, well, what's the distinction and why would you do one versus the other? So first, let's talk a little bit about registration. SIP registration is always used for SIP phones and it's sometimes used for SIP PBXs. And a typical case would be that you'd have the SIP phone at the customer premise uh, and as we've discussed some in the past uh, there's potentially going to be an Ethernet switch um, there's going to be a customer edge router and uh, then that's going to have some sort of link through possibly a fairly complex network into the session border controller which is going to be connected to the VoIP core network including the call server so the off uh, the standard thing that happens here is that this customer edge router is also a DHCP server it assigns IP addresses and those IP addresses change periodically further this device is often a NAT device, so it's actually um, sh it has a single public IP address right here on the outside of the NAT device, so that when it goes through the internet, which is full of public IP addresses, it would um, be able to pass the traffic for these phones. What's convenient about SIP registration is that it, it conveniently allows a device with a private IP address, such as, let's say, um, 10.1.2.3 to send a SIP register out, have that natted, and then when that finally arrives at the session border controller, the SBC is able to take care of that, store the both the public IP address and then information about the private IP address, and allow that system to work. Um, another convenient thing about session border, um, session border controllers and SIP registration is that the SBC tracks all those details uh, automatically when the registration is successful. So when a SIP device successfully registers, the SPC can remember that they're an authorized device and allow them to um, send traffic into the VoIP core network over here. Um, part of that automatic nature is that the SPC does not have to be manually configured in order to support each new SIP phone. So as we add new SIP phones to the network, At other customer sites or this customer site, for each new SIP phone, there's no, there's nothing new required. Basically, each of these is going to send traffic in to the SBC. The SBC will, in each case, check with a, the app server and the core, the core uh, VoIP server, and if the user is approved because they have a proper configuration and they have the proper password, then that device is going to be allowed to uh, get service. They're going to be allowed to register. They're going to be able to send calls into the network, and they're going to be able to get calls from the network. So let's talk about what's different about a PBX case. In the PBX case, we probably have the same session border controller. And I'm picking on PBXs because there are so many of them that are not capable of registering. Um, We've got the PBX out here, and the PBX, the SIP PBX, um, has a public IP address in this uh, general idea. And the, the common uh, model that's used is that there's a new public IP address assigned here. So let's say this is 68.1.2.3, and that this guy is uh, 216.1.5.6. So what we've done is assign a public IP address on the session border controller for this peering 216.1.5.6 and of course the PBX itself has its own public IP address. 
Why is a public IP address important? Because uh, NAT is not very friendly to SIP. Um, NAT devices generally are not able to do the full job of modifying the SIP payload in the proper kind of way so that the SDP portion that defines audio and the headers that control the SIP message routing are properly changed by the NAT device. Even the NAT devices that have SIP ALGs often do a pretty poor job of that. So we're just going to assume for today that this is a public IP address because that's, that's a common kind of requirement. Then, of course, the SBC in the conventional kind of way is connected to our VoIP core network. Well, think about what's required for that. Um, in the VoIP core network, we've actually got to usually assign a different IP address. So that might be a, an internal IP, 10.9.8.7. And then the server inside the VoIP core has to be set up to actually send calls um, to that special IP address. So when they want to route a call to this PBX, they first send it to this IP address, which really lives on the session border controller. The session border controller has to be configured to route that through to the PBX um, side of the network, and then we send the call to the PBX from 216.1.5.6 to the PBX IP address of 68.1.2.3. So what's happening here is that the SIP PBX is um, able to receive a call from an IP address that it always is going to expect. So it can be configured to know, you know, I know what 216.1.5.6 really means. Um, and then on the other side, when we're sending a call in, the SBC needs to know, well, when I receive a call from 68.1.2.3 and that call comes into 216.1.5.6, then I know that that means that I am supposed to send that call through uh, to the VoIP core server, the call server, and uh, I'm going to send that call from 10.9.8.7. So what, what have we have had to do here? Um, we've had to configure several things uh, manually, typically, or specially for this customer. We've had to configure the core server to understand what the IP address is of this customer. Um, that's not necessarily a major um, problem because the core server generally has to be provisioned for each new subscriber or a new PBX or SIP trunk anyway. But here's the new part. The SBC has to be configured with a new IP address on the core side, a new IP address on the peer side, typically, and then the SIP PBX has to be set up and configured. Well, again, the SIP PBX configuration had to happen anyway. And so really the interesting part of all this is that the SBC has to be configured for non-registering devices um, such as the SIP PBX, but it wouldn't have to be configured for registering devices such as a SIP phone.